The Drowning in Horseshoes Saga is one of the greatest YouTube series out there, something I've watched in its entirety at least three times and continue to come back to to this day, and it deserves my appreciation. An appreciation post, if you will. However, a rowdy parody of a review series on the My Little Pony Friendship is Magic TV series, which I shudder to even utter the name of, with an emphasis on the fourth season, complete with meta-commentary on its infamous fanbase and stuffed like sardines with quotes and allusions to present and past, modern and long-gone media is not very accessible to all audiences. Although it is the point of the work itself that even something so ridiculous and ridiculously specific as such a series can ascend to artistry, I want people to know about and like the things I like, so consider this a hopeless mitigation. With this video, I hope to explain most things you need to know about ponies and bronies to understand and appreciate the 12-hour epic that is the Horseshoe Saga. I got your lecture right here. My Little Pony Friendship is Magic first aired in October 2010, directed by Lauren Faust of collaborative Powerpuff Girls and Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends fame with the intention of entertaining little girls with legitimate wholesome feminine content, and trying to keep the adults who are inevitably also there by obligation not completely disgusted. Some young men on the internet found the show and watched it, presumably with their college frat bros for ironic enjoyment purposes, but soon found their enjoyment completely genuine, or at least they found a strange mix of post-ironic, ironic sincerity. For this cartoon for toddlers contained effort, and, dare I say it, heart, at the tail end of a cartoon industry area which was suffering artistically after the thrilling conclusion of Avatar The Last Airbender. Through two years of 4chan memes, the sinking homestuck ship, internet zeitgeist, sheer taboo, and mental gymnastics required to break your brain and appreciate something so universally believed to be unappreciable, Friendship is Magic became, for better and for worse, an internet fandom giant. This is what we call a pony. Ponies come in five brands, Earth, Pegasus, Unicorn, Baby, and Alicorn. Ponies are simple, easy to draw, and Adobe Flash customizable, making them ripe for original character material. Alicorns, however, are as rare as an Articuno, featuring both horn and wings, and only portrayed in canon as mysterious demigods, so unless you have a meaningful and engaging story to tell which you don't, it is considered distasteful to create original characters of this. Which is funny, then, when Drowning in Horseshoes cuts to a picture of his avatar as an alicorn. Yes. Every pony has this picture on their bottoms, called a cutie mark, which is a symbol of what that pony is about. Main characters get metaphorical marks, which, in an aesthetically pleasing and clever manner, deepen their character and look iconic. Background characters get hammers and clocks. Which is funny, then, when Drowning in Horseshoes gives his avatar a different cutie mark every time it cuts. Friendship is Magic is currently on its 7th or 8th season, but the orgasmic afterglow of the zeitgeist started to fade around the 3rd season, which was notably half as long and twice as lackluster, leading the fandom to slowly decline into the husk of weirdos it is now. Fans. The more popular a fanbase gets, the louder the subgroup of undesirables gets, and since this series was so abnormal, and due to its simple, exaggerated cartoony style, it garnered the reputation of a particularly troublesome crowd. Due to gender roles and a six-female ensemble cast, fans are thought to be sexually attracted to these horses. I think ponies spawned the fedora meme, certainly autism. Stuttering, incapable adolescents with nothing to do with their lives but distract themselves from themselves instead of improving themselves. I was one of them, you know, but I grew out of it. Friendship is Magic was a wholesome series about the magic of friendship, and a group of the fandom wanted to take that to heart and spread love and tolerance throughout the land. This is a kid's show, after all. However, this eventually decayed into a protective hugbox of a community, shunning controversial or negative opinions and refusing to accept criticism. This is a generalization, of course, but countless brony fans have been proven through action to misinterpret artistic intention, fail to follow social norms, and use unattractive color combinations on their original characters. Particularly when all the reasonable people stopped associating themselves with the same singular insular piece of media after three years, all that remained were the weirdos. Also, there's this website called Equestria Daily, which congregated all pony-related content to one place and became the most popular pony website as a result. Horse News, which is pretty much a 4chan version of Equestria Daily. A Flash original character creator. Pony had a lot of fan content. An endless avalanche of it, even. It was so encouraged that it just kept coming. But hold up. Rewind back to... 2011 or 2012-ish. This blogger called My Sword is Unbelievably Dull, which had been writing for a few years about anime, took a liking to Pony. Since it's basically a cute girl's anime, it's right up his alley, and he promptly lost his 20-reader audience in the process of writing exclusively about colored horses. One day, he turned that blog into a vlog by recording his pajamaed, bearded self in front of his computer and talking about Pony to the YouTube crowd, which was quite comfortable with anthologies, parody, music, and straight-up episodes posted right to the site. Remember that? Bronies, of course, expressed mindless support for this new format, this pony analysis, and urged him to continue making the same content again and again. 
This Digibro became Digibrony MLP for the first pony review show, if not the one to popularize the subgenre. Digibrony thought that footage of his gross man body on camera would turn away new viewers or something, so he had to think of something to put on screen as he rambled endlessly about his favorite programming. He could play straight up footage for a short while, but later YouTube started to take down videos with extensive pony footage for copyright infringement, so in an act of no effort mitigation, he placed a picture of a pony on the bottom right corner of the screen, and footage horizontally flipped from the show smaller on the top left. His cute and welcoming smile herded sheep by the droves, but it also spawned imitators. See this? Pony analysis content is really, really easy to make. All it takes is vocal tracks of someone talking about Friendship is Magic in any way whatsoever, slapping pirated footage on screen next to the aforementioned Pony O3 created picture of your character, and you're good to go! It's only slightly harder than making a gaming analysis video. So now we have this big sub community of Pony Analysis people, and a consistent audience of maybe 10,000 who will eat it all up. Among this sea of crap, the cream of the crop grew Gib and Take, who is now Hippocrit, two best brothers who bitch about ponies who are now Ben Saint and best guy ever, Tommy Oliver of Rebel Pixels, and Digibro. And of course, the Horseshoe King himself, drowning in horseshoes. These were not the most popular pony channels, but they were the best. Apparently Mage was there too, but I never watched her stuff, I don't know. Let's back up a little bit again. Enter Drowning in Footwear, who is today Endless Jess, jumping into the YouTube scene with AVG unstyled videos in 2011. Drowning in Footwear had all the heart in his art, but next to no audience. Endless Jess appreciated Friendship is Magic for its strong characters and genuine sincerity, and did what he did best with it. Make videos. The Pony videos, however, didn't sit well with what audience he had, contrasting strongly with his forte of pro wrestling promos, Demon's Souls, late 80s, early 90s nostalgia, and Magnum Opus masterpiece Butt Chugger. So he made a containment channel for Pony called Drowning in Horseshoes and put all the Pony stuff there. But at that point, it wasn't just random Pony stuff. Just is an artist. He had an idea, and he went for it. A caricature of the years leading up to this moment, of his YouTube career thus far. Jess injected his love for kayfabe, his gift of gab, his heel turns, quotes of shows which no one in this generation, whatever comes after millennial, would have heard of, his dry humor, and his irreverent genius comedy into his work, creating the most distinct pony fan content on this goddamn website. In a quote, analytical subgroup of a highly specific fandom in which everyone else wanted the same content of the same people saying the same things about every episode, providing nothing challenging and no variety, Jess would make his statement. Jess's pony videos were often controversial. The insular types didn't like his sheer honesty, his clever parody, his sexual innuendo, his fucking cussing, and his obscure references. They were challenged by drowning in horseshoes, emotionally and artistically. The ones who did get his stuff, however, were in it for life. Jess's content seems to resonate with few people, but the few people it does resonate with, it resonates very strongly. And the Horseshoe Saga is no exception. Again, Drowning in Horseshoes is a parody of a review series, meaning anything you don't think sounds right is probably a goof, but if it feels genuine, he's probably speaking from the heart. It's a work of fiction, based on reality. It's a story of a man. Jess's analytical content was more insightful and thorough than all the rest, and he was funnier than the best, and really, what else can you ask for from a YouTube video? It makes you laugh, and it makes you think. Despite berating his audience, Jess respects his audience enough to understand the story Jess is telling, to figure it out for themselves, and to become in on the joke. Here are some examples of awesome things Jess does with his content. Costume and set design. This looks like a regular vlog, doesn't it to you? However, the way Jess dresses and all background objects inform the viewer of what he's trying to say without spelling it out for you. Even though he does spell it out for you, he spells it out for you multiple times. One clip you'll see Jess dressed up in his Sunday best, and then it'll cut to something else, and then it'll cut back and he's got a few buttons down, and then it'll cut back to something else, then it'll cut back and it'll got a few more and he's got a bit of facial hair now. And then by the end of the video, he looks like a goddamn caveman. It's, it's amazing, it's clever, it's humorous. If you see this comic book shelf, you'll see a piece of paper tacked on with a message or drawing in crayon from Kill Me to My Waifu, and it complements the image and the message well. Always giving you something to look at, always giving you something to think about. It undercuts his lengthy discussion with a touch of madness. Another example, in an early episode when Jess talks about the diverse and rich relationships between the main six characters of the show, Jess deliberately uses homoerotic and gore-filled imagery featuring the characters he mentions to accompany his points. And that's funny. That's a funny thing to do. It's a haha. Oh, here's a subtle joke no one's gonna get. In the Rarity Takes Manhattan video, twice he mentions a voice actor or a background character which he doesn't look up the name of, he decidedly doesn't, stating he doesn't care enough to. But when he talks about this horse here, she's so cute that he instantly looks up her name, Coco Pamel, and that kind of joke is contextual and requires engagement with a work to appreciate. It requires you to pay attention. 
Starbird Bow, that's the name of the horse, Starbird Bow. His butt symbol keeps changing. Every time it cuts, it's a new meme. Haha, <laughs> funny joke. And it makes me XD every time. It's good. One of the most important distinctions between horseshoes and every other pony reaction show is the idea behind it. Drowning in Horseshoes had a story to tell from the beginning, and although it reacted to and discussed weekly episodes, it has a clear beginning, middle, and end. That's right, this review series has an ending. Because it's a story. The ending is an hour and 46 minute video, a film, a legitimate film. And I would highly recommend you watch that, even if you're not interested in a funny haha review series from the best guy on the website, then go watch Horseshoe Finale at least. Horseshoe Finale, you don't need a video to watch. You can watch that right now, and you can just get it. You can just get it. It's just him talking in front of a camera, but the way he puts it together is so engaging. It grabs you, it holds you, it grips you tightly. So if you look in the description of this video, there is a playlist of every Drowning in Horseshoes proper review in order with a few of my favorite side videos that I would highly recommend you click on and view for yourself because it's, uh, it's pretty goddamn good. I would say it rivals the JonTron era of Game Grumps in things I value and come back to and think about and laugh with. <laughs> <laughs>